Welcome to the third lecture on software architecture, specifically three-layer architecture pattern. And today I would like to recap the benefits of this pattern, why we are trying to structure our code in this way. And there are two major benefits that I would like to explore today. Obviously, there are more than these two, but these two are very important for the other material we are going to explore today. Let's start with the testability. If we structure our code in three-layer architecture pattern way, we're going to increase our testability tremendously. Let me show you how. So that's traditional application. You have your logic everywhere. Your presentation might have some business logic. Your business layer can have some presentation logic and uh, your database can have some logic as well. To properly functionally test this application, you will have to use system level tests. Essentially, you will have to spawn the whole server. You will need to have some real database, even if it's a memory database, and you will need to run fairly slow tests for this. It can be reasonably fast and reasonably stable, but it will never be as stable and as fast as the alternative. And the alternative is called subcutaneous tests. What is subcutaneous tests? Essentially, it is a test which is not a system level test, but which allows you to test the functional logic of application without necessarily creating the whole application. So you can test your application functionally without having a database or web server. Let's have a look at how it looks in our code. It's very simple. Check this out. So this test is subcutaneous functional test. It looks like it is a unit test, but from this test standpoint, it doesn't matter how many classes or code inside user service will call. What it tests instead is the business logic of the user service. And yes, of course, you will lose some coverage with this, but you will get so much speed that this coverage loss is reasonable. And you will need to add some system level tests to have a better coverage. But your overall test automation efficiency will be on the whole different level. Let me show you. So if I test this whole system using system, using system level tests, the time to execute the test suite will be 12 seconds. You will have 100% class coverage, around 95% code coverage, not too bad, and 12 seconds for this very simple application. If I test this application functionally using subcutaneous tests, it will be 21 millisecond, 600 times faster. And of course, you lose some code coverage. It can be, it can look a significant loss on this very simple example. But in reality, the loss will not be so dramatic. And when you add one or two system level tests, there will be no loss of the coverage whatsoever. But you will get extremely fast automated test suite. Another benefit is extendability. You not only can test your application functionally in a very efficient way, you can also extend it if it is needed. And by extending, what I mean by that? Well, actually, you can extend and reuse your application code. For example, if you want to add a new interface to the application, you can do this. You just implement presentation layer in a slightly different way. So you can have, let's say, REST API and GraphQL API at the same place using the very same code or even so, or if you want, you can actually add a web UI for the very same functionality. And most of the business logic will stay the same and will use the same code, if not all this business logic. And similarly, you can change the storage fairly easily. I mentioned in memory database, sometimes to speed up system level tests, it actually a good idea to use not the 
disk based but in memory database you don't have lots of data in your system level suite well not usually at least and for this you can use in memory database it will be way faster probably on the order of magnitude faster or you can at some point decide that MySQL does not work for you. You want to switch to Postgres or to a MySQL or to no SQL solution. And to do this, all you need to do is to implement new storage adapter. Well, it would be fun to show you both presentation and storage changes, but I think the idea should be fairly clear. So I will just show you how easily I can change the storage logic. Right now we have in-memory storage. Our storage is essentially mock, which is using some library built-in data structures to store the data. What if I want to use some database? So we're gonna implement a SQLite storage adapter. Okay, so let's have a look at the interface that we have and which we need to re-implement now using SQLite instead of in-memory storage. We can do essentially five operations with this interface. We can add new user, we can get existing user by ID, we can delete user by ID, and we can update existing user too. We can also find a user by name if we need to. And also luckily, we have tests in place. So when we do this refactoring, we should be able to retest the functionality without major difficulties. So let's go to the persistence and let's create a new storage there. We will call it SQLite storage. Simple, let's go light, storage, Bye. And our SQLite storage, I want to move it here so I see the interface which we are going to implement. Our SQLite storage is implementing user storage. So let's define our new class, class, SQLite, that's fine. We're going to just implement constructor. Let's start with the constructor, uh, because the constructor is going to be a bit more complex than the in-memory storage constructor. In the constructor, what we want to do, we want to be able to connect to the existing database file or create a new one. And also we need to check if the table exists. And if it doesn't exist, we can create this. Now, it not necessarily has to be this way. In real life, you don't usually put any database in initialization logic into the constructor. But in our case, I think it is a reasonable enough thing to do. So that's the kind of the code that we got. And now I'm going to use a Python debug console in order to test this and see how it works. So let me open my Python debug console. Um, okay, so import persistence SQLite storage. Yeah, okay, that's good enough. And then we are going to use the file SQLite uh, SQL storage. Just storage doesn't really matter. Equals persistence SQLite storage SQLite storage so we definitely don't have a file now and we expect this file to be created automatically let's see have created the storage let's just see and yes the file was created it means our logic working correctly now the other thing is that again in real life you don't want to have more than one user storage for this, you can either use a singleton or make sure at the initialization or program initialization level that you don't create uh, storage more than once. This course is not on patterns, so I'm going to skip a singleton part, but I'm working on the course on software patterns, which will be available not free unfortunately but still is going to be available in recent month so don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you can know when it's available now we have our initialization logic what we need to do we need to be able to create a table 
Well, luckily, it is very simple and SQLite because you can actually use a SQL statement, create table if not exist. So let's create a couple of statements here. So create table statement. So that's going to be it. We're going to have user ID, which is the primary key, username. Let, let me check what fields we have. So we need to have user ID. That's okay. Username. That's okay. We don't need password and email. We do need first name and last name. And for now, we are not using a role, but I still want to create a role. Uh, let's say role and that's going to be integer. Now, if I do it like this, I will need to make it a foreign key uh, and I need to create two tables, user and role at this moment. We don't need the role just yet. We're going to explore roles when we are going to work on authentication. So I will just skip role as integer and we'll hard code this to number one. And as simple as that, we are just executing a statement and if the table doesn't exist, it will be created for us. Now let's see what method we need to implement once again. It is add, get, delete, update and find by username. So let's just do it one by one. Uh, let's say get. And we are finding a user from users by user ID is the user which was provided to us. You can also extend this uh, SQLite statement to the uh, to the constant if you want. Actually, let's do this. Let's say uh, get user statement and we put it here and we just replace it. Is this one. And then it should work. Let's double see what this generated code. Uh, let's check again what this generated code is doing. So that's our cursor. We execute the connection. We fetch one. And if row is none, we return none. And if it's not, none. It's kind of suggesting that we need to have a role to user. A function which we don't have. So let's create this. Row 1, row 2, row 3, user row. Okay. I think that should do. Yes, I think that should do. Now we have row to user. And let me see. Do I need to use a cursor for this? Yes, actually, I have created, I, I have made a mistake in the constructor. So I need to use cursor here. It's not going to be self cursor It's just going to be cursor. And after executing it, we just going to close cursor. Yeah, like this. And then we're going to close cursor again. Let's do similarly for delete, update and find by username. And then we will run our test and see if they're going to pass. All right, so that's how our code is going to look like. We're going to get and add for now. I'm not going to implement other functionality because I want you to implement this instead. It's very simple. There are a couple of things I would like to highlight because I'm kind of expecting people uh, throwing nasty comments at me. Uh, the code that I had written is not very modular, it's not very good, and it's not very error safe. It's not bulletproof, really. Uh, for example, when I'm executing something here, there might be an exception, and I'm not handling this well in I'm not only not handling this well, I don't handle those exceptions at all. And uh, this is not a very good thing to do. So you need to have a proper error handling here. But again, our course is not about that. So I'm going to let it be like this right now. In my repository, the link to this in the description.
there will be all five methods from the user storage class implemented. But here I'm just going to implement two and let you implement three others so you can actually practice with it a bit more. But before moving too far, let's run a test. Let's just comment this out. And let's say the self user storage I want is going to be not in memory, but instead is going to be SQL light storage. And let's run our tests concerning concerning what in this case get and add user. Here is the first test that should be able to create and retrieve user which which verifies those two methods. Run test. We run test and it fails because uh, actually in order to be able to run this a very simple test, we need to be able to find by username. Well, if we have to, let's do this. I'm going to do it really, really simple. Not going to use that. Yeah, so we have implemented find by username similarly to other methods. Let's see if it fixes our test. And now our test is passing. So we just replaced the in-memory storage to SQLize storage. Our business logic hasn't changed and everything just works. And even though our SQLize storage is not very good, is not in very good shape code quality wise, we already have a working functionality and we can actually now refactor the code, make it better without losing the functionality making sure that we don't introduce new defects into our code. And that is what I mean by extendability.